Natalie Wood, in love with a proper stranger, vivid proof that it was a big year for girls in technical difficulty. You're one of those people who has had numerous uh, Oscar nominations, and you must have uh, sweated that out a lot of times. Uh, how many? Well, three? Uh, three times, you know? yes. Well, it can be. I mean, it can be. There's that little moment where you, you convince yourself that there's not a chance or any way you voted for somebody else or something. Mm -hmm. But then just before they say the name, you know, yeah. you have that little... <gasps> and yeah. then they say the other name, and then you relax. <laughs> Even with the presence of Leslie Caron in the lineup of 1963, no nominee symbolized Hollywood stardom like Natalie Wood. Only 25 years old, she had been in show business for a longer time than any of her co-nominees and she was one of the few child stars to make a successful transition into adult roles. When she received her nod for Love with the Proper Stranger, she became, next to Teresa Wright, the youngest performer ever to receive three Oscar nominations. A record that maybe has by now been broken by Jennifer Lawrence, but it still stands as a sensational success story. But like so many Hollywood stories, one not achieved without high costs. The peak of Natalie's stardom came in 1961. She played the lead in West Side Story, the biggest box office and Oscar hit of the year, and she worked with director Elia Kazan in Splendor in the Grass, which brought her critical acclaim and made her a strong favorite for the Best Actress Oscar, which was ultimately won by Sophia Loren, the first non-English language performer to win an Oscar. I guess they're afraid that it would upset me. Oh, but, huh? 1961 had shown that Natalie Wood had made a transition from child star to Hollywood star. She was a fan favorite, she brought in money, and she could carry a challenging project like Splendor in the Grass. It was the kind of peak that many actresses can only dream to achieve, and Natalie Wood was only 23. When I was telling folks that I was going to have Natalie Wood, men say, oh, I really like her. Really? I think, yes, I really think, you know that. No, but I, I don't, I don't know that, but I'm glad you told me that. But even if by 1962, Natalie Wood was already a long-standing star and two-time Oscar nominee, she was an easy target for critics who clearly enjoyed putting her down as her popularity made her almost untouchable and who were often downright vicious in their dismissal of her talents. Me with no talent, as you've kept reminding me my whole life, look at me now, I'm a star! From a personal point of view, I would say that Natalie Wood was probably not the greatest actress that ever graced the screen, but she knew how to use her star charisma to fully captivate the audience, and she was always willing and determined to give more to her parts than just star persona, to dig deeper and take risks in her acting. Mom, if you do something like that, I'll do something desperate! I will! I will, Mom! I will! Reaching the top so early in her career had a clear downside because for the rest of her life, Natalie Wood would be obsessed to reach this peak again. In a way, the opposite of co-nominee Rachel Roberts. She didn't want to be seen just as a star, but feel respect and acknowledgement for her dramatic talents, be taken seriously as an actress, and to finally win that long-desired Oscar. As friends put it, she strived to be the perfect actress. She wanted to be the best actress in Hollywood, even the world. The Academy Award was very big to her. It was a dream that would never become reality for her. And also she would continue to be a major star for many years, the time where everything came together for her so perfectly was over. After all, who would have thought that at the age of 25, Natalie Wood would be past her Oscar prime and never be nominated again. When we grow up, that we have to forget the ideals of youth. But why exactly did her career not develop in the way she had wished for? Following her Oscar nomination for Splendor in the Grass, Natalie Wood divorced husband Robert Wagner and began a much publicized affair with Warren Beatty. Proving Leslie Caron's statement about him dating women who have just been nominated for Academy Awards very right. The two of them would be seen at many movie premieres together and also attended the 62 Academy Awards as one of the most photographed couples, again making it clear how much Natalie's movie star persona dominated over her perception as an actress. Many people seem to think that, uh, you know, it's Hollywood or that's the kind of 
conclusion that's easy to jump to, but I don't think it was that. I think probably we, we were immature. We didn't know ourselves, really. Uh, I think we loved each other very much, but we were uh, not, not very mature. The divorce from Robert Wagner, however, took a great toll on her. Friends saying she was destroyed by the dissolution of her dream of a perfect family and suicidal. If I'd had more patience and more intelligence about it and hadn't been so selfish on my own part, I probably, we might have been able to get through that rocky period. But that's, you know, you can only play the cards you dealt. As friends remember, she was just trying to survive. And Beatty just happened to fall in, which was good. It helped her. Like Patricia Neal, Natalie was blamed as the responsible party and she accepted the untrue rumors that her affair with Beatty had already begun before she separated from her husband. The little girl from Miracle on 34th Street was now a callous and heartless glamour girl who gave up her husband for an affair with Warren Beatty. She herself said, doesn't everyone search for happiness? But I guess I haven't found it yet. I don't think too much about happiness either. Now what's the point, guy? You gotta take what comes. Many who observed Natalie during those years compared her to Marilyn Monroe as a woman who was plagued by depression and often needed pills to go either through the day or through the night. I think you're the saddest girl I ever met. It was actually a common comparison, not only in regards to her private life, but also her acting. As some observed that both Marilyn and Natalie had this way of communicating her innermost thoughts and feelings, as if it was just for you and the camera was the person watching. And Natalie, like Marilyn, was never convinced of her own talents, always dependent on the approval of others. She could sit there and tell more with one look than most actors could tell with 15 pages of dialogue. What gave Natalie hope during these times was her project Love with the Proper Stranger. The story of an Italian-American sales girl who gets pregnant after a one-night stand and then slowly falls in love with the father of her unborn child. Love with the Proper Stranger was directed by Robert Mulligan and produced by Alan Pacula, both of whom had just worked together on To Kill a Mockingbird. So there was an atmosphere of prestige surrounding the project. I am confident that you gentlemen will review without passion, the evidence. Natalie loved the script and the character, her bravery, realness and intelligence and was certain this was the project she needed to prove once and for all that she could act and was a serious actress. You're sure? Yeah. Natalie saw it as the most rewarding experience in films all the way around. My personal life was quite meager then and the picture was it. By the time she started working on Love with the Proper Stranger, her relationship with Warren Beatty was almost over again. A fact that would shape her work as she used her vulnerability from these stressful times and put it into her performance. Get away from me, please! Just get away from me! And stay away from me! Whoa. I don't want to see you anymore, ever! Now listen, we Go! The movie was released in December 63 to overall positive notices. It was seen as one of the best comedy dramas for a long time. A tragic tale brightly told and due to its comedic elements and often fantasy-like storyline, not seen as grim or controversial like the L-shaped room. The main criticism was that it was unbelievable that Steve McQueen's character would not remember having sex with Natalie Wood. And fair. As for Natalie's acting, she was right that the character of Angie would help her to be recognized as a serious actress. It was not the peak of 1961, but critics noted that like Leslie Caron in the same year, Natalie had finally grown up and it was called her first full-blown woman role and that she proved herself as one of Hollywood's most accomplished actresses in one of her best performances to date. But even in the praise, critics found room for a bit of snark, saying that she had played similar roles before but this was the first time she was believable or that the movie would have been even better with a quote, real actress. Let's forget about that. Will you just forget about it? Watching the movie, it's clear that this is not the best part of her career, as the mix of comedy and drama in Love with the Proper Stranger often feels out of place and did not do Natalie any favors by constantly dropping every bit of dramatic possibility for the sake of some quick laughs. But Natalie's charm, personality and way of filling her part with a style that is light enough for her movie, while also catching some more serious undertones nevertheless, were able to captivate the viewer and 
even though not in a completely satisfying manner, made her work both entertaining and provoking. You don't have to go with me. I mean it. Just, just give me the uh, address and tell me where I'm supposed to go. Unfortunately, Love is the Proper Stranger is never truly interested in Angie's personal troubles, her worries and fears, but only in the question, how do we get these two together in the end? There are moments when Natalie Wood found a deeper layer in this woman and showed that she did not just play her with a combination of smiles and tears, but also with a true understanding of her personal situation. But the movie was not interested enough in those moments to allow Natalie Wood to give a truly accomplished performance. Every plotline in Love with the Proper Stranger is always put in the overall context of a light romantic comedy. Which is not to say that this genre doesn't allow for strong acting, but Natalie Wood constantly feels trapped between two different approaches to her character, not being able to realize either of them effectively. But she still manages to find certain moments of truth in both sides of the roles, portraying a believable sadness and desperation, while also carrying the lighter moments with an equally light approach. You know why I've never been able to leave home? I just suddenly figured it out. Very complicated. I was scared. And I'm not scared anymore. <laughs> I'm terrified. <laughs> Funny. The beginning of Natalie Wood's performance is not only a very intriguing entrance, but may even be her best scene of the entire picture. When she wants to tell Rocky that she is pregnant and then suddenly realizes that he does not even remember her, Natalie Wood let Angie react with a combination of slight amusement and anger at herself for having expected this reaction and yet having hoped for something else. Oh, um, uh, you don't know who I am, do you? It's commendable that Natalie Wood refused to win any sympathy at this moment and showed that Angie is not in the process of making up her mind, but actually made it up already. Or at least that's what she thinks. I'm gonna have a baby. But unlike the L-shaped room, Love is the Proper Stranger does not give its leading lady room to develop and come to terms about her feelings for her unborn child. As the movie only wants Angie to reflect about her emotional feelings towards Rocky. Don't worry, I'm not gonna cause you any trouble. All I want from you is a doctor, an address, you know? In some ways, it's a typical romance between two different characters who everyone knows will end up together at the end. The baby is apparently only thrown in to spice things up a bit. But due to this, Natalie Wood's performance often comes across as thoughtless and one-dimensional in regards to her character's pregnancy, and the uneven tone of the movie prevents her from digging deeper in the part than she might have had otherwise. Uh, I mean, if two people just start out being um, nice to each other, if they're just concerned about uh, what happens to each other, that's all, and, they, and they're just nice, mm -hmm. then uh, I think it happens, don't you? <laughs> Uh, love. But still, Natalie Wood handles many parts of her role with movie star charisma, that helps her to overcome various problems of the script. When she is arguing with her stereotypical Italian family, slamming doors, shouting through the apartment, packing her bags to leave forever, she does not try to go for any dramatic intensity, but mostly emphasizes all these scenes with a slight exaggerated acting style that is genuinely funny. You, you follow me around on dates, you pick out all my boyfriends. It's my job to protect you. Well, then why don't you protect Guido for a change? Take him to lunch. Every night he goes out with all kinds of... Get Guido, Guido. Guido's a boy. Who cares what he does? Yes, she may miss to craft the character of Angie in these moments, and just like the movie itself, drops dramatic depths and development for the sake of short-term entertainment, but within these limitations, it's still a refreshing and sometimes actually touching approach because it works as a nice contrast to her later, more dramatic scenes. Natalie Wood also may not truly work well together with Steve McQueen, but what she does achieve is the captivating portrayal of a woman who is looking for help only to realize that the man who is supposed to help her actually needs her support much more. But underneath all this hair and skin is a human girl with all the regular things going for me. And believe it or not, I don't want to spend the rest of my life married to a man who's doing me a big favor. So Natalie Wood gives a performance that doesn't go beyond the surface and struggles to find a style and theme, 
but still works to a certain extent because her charm and her ability to handle comedy and drama are still intriguing, poignant and entertaining. You look so... What am I gonna tell you? You look like a woman. How can you manage to make even a compliment sound like a slap in the face? What did I say? You look like a woman. I apologize. Excuse me. You look like a man. You wanna fight all day? In the race of 63, Natalie Wood did not play any relevant part. She loved the character, but it wasn't the kind of role that gets awards and in the end, it was just an honor to be nominated. But the thought of winning an Oscar and continuing to prove the seriousness of her talents would continue to haunt Natalie for the rest of her life, needing to validate her artistic talent and reaching the ultimate goal of Hollywood stars. It was ambition, but it was ambition on a different level. It was the ambition to be extremely good and know as much as you possibly can in the area that she had chosen, in something that she loved. So it wasn't a drive simply for an end result. She didn't want to be the biggest star. She wanted to be the very best she could be. At this point, Natalie was still, next to Elizabeth Taylor, the highest paid actress in the world and an undeniable box office sensation and movie star. But she kept being unsatisfied. She hoped that projects like Inside Daisy Clover or This Property is Condemned would bring her the awards and respect she so desperately wanted. This Property is Condemned was based on a one-act play by Tennessee Williams and Natalie noted that it was the closest I'll ever get to playing Blanche Dubois, the role that she always considered the benchmark for actresses. You are staring straight into my eyes, which is impolite. Like with many other roles, she got attention for her work by the Hollywood Foreign Press, but no Oscar nomination in the end. In most cases, her movies never met the expectations of critics who often called them disappointing and their overall failure made it hard for Natalie to stand out positively, which in turn increased her low sense of self-esteem. Her overall dissatisfaction with her professional and private life would lead to various suicide attempts. I don't care what happens. <laughs> I haven't any pride. Like Leslie Caron, Natalie was also one of the names mentioned in connection to Bonnie and Clyde, but she later said that she turned it down as it would be shot in Texas and she didn't want to be away from her analyst. Certainly a sensible decision, but she often regretted it, saying how much she loved the script and a part of Bonnie. Seeing how the role then earned an Oscar nomination for Faye Dunaway and how the movie became a cultural milestone only increased her low self-esteem as she continued to be defined by her stardom instead of her talents. Around this time, she was named the worst actress by the Harvard Lampoon organization. Natalie, however, took it as a joke and, decades before Halle Berry or Sandra Bullock, accepted the award in person. You should um, try to, you know, accept awards that are given you and, and um, they invited me and I, I thought it was only polite to come and accept the award and, and I feel very honored about it. And I think it's sort of unique because um, for last year it was, uh, they'd given me the award for Love of the Proper Stranger for the worst actress and I had also been nominated for the best actress so I thought that was kind of interesting kind of to have <laughs> those two awards you know, for the same performance. <laughs> After her movie Penelope, another unhappy experience for her, she bought herself out of her contract with Warner Brothers and fired all her agents and business associates, calling it a step-by-step -step progression to normalcy. I had worked so much, you know, since I was a child, uh, all during my childhood, that really by the time I was sort of 20 or 21, I wasn't, I didn't really have a very clear perception of myself. You know, I was always, I was Betty Davis's daughter or Maureen O'Hara's daughter or Jimmy Stewart's daughter or something like that. But I mean, you know, I, I was sort of uh, discombobulated. It's always important to remember that when Natalie Wood reached this point of exhaustion, she was only 28. I have been working steadily since I was five. I had to have two years of just living, catching up. I never thought I could do this well, really. Looks better with one eye closed. <laughs> you. <laughs> Natalie's break would last until 1969, when she did one of her most remembered roles in the satire Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. The same year, she also got married again and had her first child in 1970. She would now devote her time to her baby daughter, calling herself semi-retired, making up for all the time she had lost as a child star. 
However, her marriage to producer Richard Gregson would only last until 1971. It was again a difficult time for her, as gossip outlets were constantly interested in the reason for their breakup and then found what they were looking for when Natalie Wood and ex-husband Robert Wagner began dating again in early 1972 and later remarried. And here they are together again for the first time, Mr. and Mrs. Robert Wagner. Their newfound love for each other was one of the main news topics across the country. How come you got married to Bob Wagner again? Again? I mean, and how does it feel when you marry your husband after you divorced him? And if you don't want to talk about it, we'll pass. Oh, it feels terrific. I don't mind talking about okay. it. I was just fortunate, you know, timing uh, was, uh, was on our side. We happened to meet at a time when we were both free. The fact that we both had feelings toward the other one we didn't keep to ourselves. I mean, we managed to convey that because I really had no idea that, that uh, RJ felt something still toward me, even though I knew that I did, and he felt the same way and didn't know if I did. Natalie was now happier than ever and had a second child with Wagner, turning down projects like the towering Inferno to focus on her private life. I worked very early on, and then uh, when most people are sort of working, I kind of took time off, and, uh, and um, I had my kids um, when I was not in my 20s, I was 30, the first time I became pregnant. So I don't know, I, I just did it in a little different order. One of the later highlights of her career came when Laurence Olivier asked her to play Maggie in a TV production of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof opposite Robert Wagner as Brick. For an actress so determined to be taken seriously, this offer was obviously a dream come true. Unfortunately, the production itself did not create any positive reviews but Natalie was praised for giving the performance of her career. I think that's a good sign. A sign of nerves and a player on the defensive. By this point, Natalie, despite her movie star stature, was not a box office hit anymore. Her last two success had been Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice, and she began to turn to television more regularly. For example, playing Karen in a TV production of From Here to Eternity, a role that won her a Golden Globe. She was also interested in projects like Ordinary People or Sophie's Choice, but after having been out of the business for so long, it was basically impossible for her to get cast in sought-after parts again. She had high hopes that the science fiction film Brainstorm would finally lead to a comeback for her. But it would sadly be her last film role, as Natalie tragically died in December 1981. Good evening everyone, tonight our metropolitan area and the whole world mourns the death of 43-year-old movie actress Natalie Wood. Miss Wood won the hearts and minds of fans of the silver screen everywhere. Miss Wood, a three-time Oscar nominee, was found dead shortly after dawn yesterday just off Santa Catalina Island. She'd been with her husband, actor Robert Wagner, and another actor, Christopher Walken. It was a terrible end to a remarkable but also often tragic career, during which Natalie Wood would never find true satisfaction with her work, and far too seldom with her life overall, haunted by depression and her time as a child actress, always convinced that she was not good enough for what she wanted to have. Of course, her movie star appeal is unquestioned, but it's important to remember that she was a talented actress too. The kind of star who could build a close connection to the audience, who could evoke sadness and sympathy so easily, and who was often successful in combining this movie star appeal with real character work. <laughs> like Leslie Caron, Natalie might often not have been taken fully seriously, but she has a place in Hollywood history due to many of her movies and the longevity of her career. She said gay rights long before anyone else would have even dared to, and she was the kind of actress basically every co-star remembers fondly and lovingly. Maureen Stapleton, who had worked with her on Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, summed it up as, she had a quality that made you want things turn out well for her in the end. 